All right, very good. Well, good morning, everyone. And, uh, and here we are. Okay, let me just catch up to the place where I want to start our review of this all important slide. And I think it's right here. <clears throat> what this slide is trying to do is trying to show the idea of this slope concept in two different ways, one purely geometric and one, this idea of rates of change, which really get to the heart of what the calculus is about and really gets into what, why the calculus has such power in applied mathematics. It's not so much looking for tangent lines, okay? That's an interesting geometric question. And it has a correlation to this idea of rate of change, but it's the idea of rate of change, which really brings us into the, into the world of, uh, of the powerful world of calculus uh, in terms of applied mathematics, the physics and the astronomy and, and, and all the rest. So the geometric answer uh, is found here with this idea of we're looking for the tangent line geometrically. Remember, now that we're working in the platform of analytic geometry, it's not the tangent line that we need. We have the point that we're interested in. We have this point P. We know the coordinates of P. If you want to know the tangent line, what I need to know is the slope of the tangent line, because I just need to know two pieces of information to find that line. I need to know a point on it. Well, I've got the point P. That's the point of interest. The other piece of information I need to totally describe the line in the platform of, of analytic geometry is the slope. So what we're looking for is the slope of this line. Well, the idea is to define slope properly as the change in Y and the change in X. And the idea is to slide these points on the curve. These are points Q1, Q2, Q3. They are on the curve Y is equal to F of X. And as they get closer and closer to my target point P, certainly the lines look like they're getting closer and closer to this tangent line that I've drawn. Uh, hopefully this is the idea that this is the correct line that it only touches the uh, curve at that one point P and stays on one side of the curve, the definition of the tangent line. It seems like this is a reasonable way to approach the problem of getting the tangent line, that as Q gets closer and closer to P, Yes, they continue to touch the curve in two places. That's not a tangent line. None of those points Q can create the tangent line. But if we can see in our mind's eye that as Q gets closer and closer to P, then they're touching the curve at two closer and closer points. And in infinity or when Q finally touches, you know, that whatever that process in your mind's eye that you want to use right now, uh, that Q finally moves into P in some way, that Q approaches P in some way, that that line, that line that Q is creating will meld into the line that we're looking at that only touches the curve at P. This is an intuitive idea. And so as we change the change of, uh, change of X, that gives us a corresponding change of Y this is a corresponding different slope. And the idea as delta X gets smaller and smaller, delta Y here is getting smaller and smaller. And the slopes that we're computing are getting closer and closer to the slope that we're after, the slope at P, the slope at P, okay? You know, the line does have a tangent line. I mean, geometrically, this curve does have a tangent line. So what's its slope, okay? we can only approach it uh, in, in this fashion. The way we write this uh, is we kind of bring up a new piece of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, of notation here. We're looking for the slope of the tangent line, the change in Y or the change in X, as the change in X gets smaller and smaller. You have to realize, you have to remember, the change in Y depends upon the change in X. These are not two independent numbers. You give me a change in X for this particular function, I'll give you the change in Y. I'll use the computational rule F to, and, and, and your change in X to compute change in Y. Okay, this is, the, the, this is a, a fraction that has a coherency to it. The fraction depends upon the size of the denominator. It's not a free flowing fraction. 
So therefore, that fraction is determined as I make the denominator anything I want. Well, I'm talking about making the denominator smaller and smaller. That determines the change in y. That determines the, the value of, of the fraction. Okay. That's the geometric answer. Then we get to actually the, the more profound thing. We move away from pure geometry and we, we step back and say, but what are these curves? What are these functions? What is this slope in fact? It's a rate of change of the functional value, you know, can be looked at over the, over the value of, of, of X itself. A rate of change, this is not an easy idea. The classic rate of change is 60 miles per hour. That is a rate of change. For every hour you go 60 miles. It's the same as going 120 miles every two hours. It's the same as going 30 miles per half hour. It's the same as going a mile a minute. These are all different ways of talking about the rate of change of distance over time. I can take that, 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 that change in distance and make it from the numerator into the denominator. I go ahead and rent an Uber, and they tell me that the rate is $5 per mile. They're gonna charge me a certain amount of money per mile, as opposed to miles per hour, I now have money per mile. This is another rate, a rate that I'm gonna be charged uh, you know, for my limousine service. Okay. Rates are everywhere. And it turns out the reason why calculus is so powerful, getting to <laughs> the spoiler rate of the whole course, the reason why calculus is so powerful in applied mathematics is because it turns out that the laws of nature, the laws essentially of physics and chemistry and geology and, uh, and even moving into the social sciences, okay, the laws of nature are written in terms of rates of change. That's it. <laughs> That's why the calculus is the calculus. That's why it is everywhere because the world runs on descriptions of itself using rates of change. And of course, we will see many examples of this as the course proceeds. All right, so this very abstract idea of the rate of change, what these slopes are that we've been computing are average rates of change. You take some kind of change in X and you find out what the gross change in Y is going through that change of X. And so that's considered and the average rate of change of the function, you know, going from P up to that Q value. Well, if the Qs are sliding down to the Ps getting closer and closer, then what I'm after, what this slope is, seems to be intuitively the instantaneous rate of change, the change just at the point P. And that is, as the wonderful uh, video I asked you to watch, if you had the chance before class today, of the second installment of the essence of calculus uh, class, the conundrum, the basically the oxymoron, the, 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 the paradox of asking for the rate of change of something at a point when it doesn't change. How can that be, okay? It, it makes no sense to ask about the change, but clearly there is a slope there, there is a geometric slope. And if that slope is getting, you know, being approximated by these, these average rates of change, then we can talk about just as the curve is changing just at P. Can we think about the, the, the although P is an individual point and it only has a value, the value is X zero, Y zero, but is the curve changing at that point? Is it, can we see that, yeah. And if it is, then this is, as, as, the, as the video says, it is the best approximation. This process that we're doing is the best approximation to finding what that change is at that instant. We will have a lot more to say about this, of course. We're just still trying to work uh, conceptually. Okay? And I've not even given you a hint here in my slide as to how we go about finding this slope. What's going on as delta x goes to zero. Again, the video does that. The video goes through some algebra. The video takes x cubed as an example and tries to show what this process would look like. We haven't even done that yet, okay? Uh, and we won't, we won't do that today, okay? I'm just trying to work conceptually uh, at first, although the video was great and it does a wonderful job in showing uh, that. Okay, so there we are. 
we have these two different views. We have a geometric view of our problem of tangents, and we have this much more profound view because we have something that the, that, that, that the Greeks really didn't have. They didn't have this very clear idea of a function. They didn't really focus on the idea of a function. They didn't have the, the platform for it. And they also did not work in terms of motion. They didn't work in terms of moving quantities, of changing quantities. Their geometry is very much a static thing. You all of a sudden have these functional relationships and you can very naturally start talking about how they change, how the relationships change one quantity as the other quantity changes. You really need a different platform for that. You need a much more powerful algebra than the Greeks had. You need a visual platform of the analytic geometry that, which the Greeks have. And yeah, there's no coincidence that calculus could not be invented without analytic geometry. There is no way. There's no way to do this to think about this without the platform of analytic geometry. Okay, here is the second most important slide in the presentation, and let's very quickly go through that. We have our favorite function, x squared. It has a, a, a functional value, y is equal to x squared, it has a table of values. And we know if we can take any particular point P, looking for the tangent line, we know what we're really looking for is the slope of the tangent line. I know what the line looks like in analytic geometry. The only number I don't know in that equation is M. That's what I'm looking for. I know the rest of the equation. I can fill in the form of the equation. Turns out for this equation, uh, for this uh, function X squared, it turns out that the, um, that the slope of the line is two X. You give me any X, the slope of the line is two X and therefore my problem is solved. So I, in fact, have turned this into a new computational rule to find that tangent line. Okay. Well, the slope now is a function of x, just as y is a function of x. You give me an x, I'll tell you the y value. Now you give me an x, I'll tell you the slope at that x, y value. So temporarily, let's call this function s the slope. <laughs> it, uh, remember, it's defined to be that process of trying to find what happens to the tangent lines, the slopes of the tangent lines, as the denominator gets smaller and smaller, as my change gets smaller and smaller, that approximation, that's what that whole bunch of letters are, dy, dx, as delta x goes to zero, that whole thing is this process in our mind, um, uh, which again, the, 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 the essence video showed how the algebra works out in a very concrete way. We're gonna do that for, <clears throat> for 2x uh, at some point soon. But the point is, we do get to an algorithm. We do get to a, a way of finding out what this function is. In our case, it's 2x. Okay. Well, and again, I'm just reminding that where this is coming from is this process. If you take a look at this very closely, guys, this, this delta y is not on the tangent line. I don't know the tangent line. This line goes up to the curve. Okay, this point, this line goes above the tangent line. I'm taking up two points on the curve. And I'm going to let that point slide down the curve. Okay. So visually, look at that carefully. Make sure you realize I don't know what the tangent line is. I can't pick a second point on the tangent line. I'm trying to find the tangent line by using that process. Once I get the, the, that value 2x uh, for any x, then I can go ahead and draw any tangent line I want. So the function s is called the derivative of the function f. It certainly depends upon the function f. There will be algorithms of the wazoo that you learned in Calc 1 how to find uh, the s function from the f function. <clears throat> it has its own table of values. It has a life of its own. It has a derivative of its own. Oh yeah, we can take derivatives of derivatives. There's no reason once you've got a function, you can ask for its rate of change, okay? This can go on on infinitum. <clears throat> So the, 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 the derivative is itself a function and it clearly depends upon f. So therefore it makes sense to write the derivative function in some way that you know, refers to the original function f. And there are two ways uh, traditionally in which that's done in calculus. One is we focus on the fact that y is equal to f of x, that y and f of x are the same thing. And so we go from these delta y's over delta x, we go to the dy dx notation of life. This, this is a very beautiful and powerful and suggestive notation. When it comes to learning the algorithms, the, to, to think about this dy dx as a true fraction, to handle it as a separate numerator and denominator, it turns out to be completely 
illegal in terms of the strict mathematics of the process, but it turns out that it works out algorithmically very beautifully. So you can deal with this thing as a fraction in an algorithmic way, you're back into using old fashioned algebra. It's quite amazing that this works. This is a piece of genius uh, on Leibniz's part to write this as a fraction, which actually you can think of as a separate numerator and a separate denominator. <clears throat> the other way is even more pedestrian. We have this function f, well, the derivative is f prime. It's the, you know, it's the, uh, the, the, the son or the daughter of f. I think Shrogas calls it the, the forward problem. I give you f, you go forward to the derivative f prime. So these are just notations. Okay, very important to see visually, to get this idea of the, uh, of the derivative function as being related to the, uh, the original function. Let's see if this visual will help. Okay, I've got two graphs here. Yeah, we I finally moved away from x squared. Aren't you, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sure you got sick of x squared. So let's take a function which is more interesting. We've got this really quite, quite a function here on the left-hand side, x to the fourth minus four x squared plus three x plus one. It's an example, I made it up, okay? And this is its graph, okay? Very interesting graph uh, of the function. Uh, let's not worry about the function on the right for a moment, that's the derivative function, obviously. Let's just focus on the function on the left, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, first of all, just let me run the animation. Looking at the function uh, on, on the left, you see there are two black dots uh, moving along and we have the tangent line as we move along. Okay. So what am I after here? Well, first of all, this black dot here on the x-axis it's just keeping track of what the x value is. We're just visually trying to keep track for us of where we are on the function, because the function does move quite a bit uh, up and down. So that's that black dot. This black dot here is the actual point. It's the functional value. It's you know, the, the x, y value coordinates uh, of the function given the computational rule, x to the fourth minus four x squared plus three x plus one. It's a monster. Uh, you know, Mathematica has no trouble calculating these very, very quickly, okay? And, and the line itself, well, that's the tangent line. That's the, we can get a visual of what the slope would look like. Here's, this is a very, you know, very big slope, right? It's a very, very slanty line. It's going up quite quickly. So that's what we're looking at here in this function. Okay. And well, what is, the, what is the tangent telling us? What is the slope telling us? It's telling us the value of the derivative function. That's what was the whole point was to, to find a way to compute these different uh, slopes as they're changing. And now look what happens to the slope as we get closer and closer to the bottom. Okay, the function uh, is, you know, the slope is, is, is becoming less and less slopey until finally uh, it becomes a slope of, of zero. Okay, why is it a slope of zero geometrically? Well, you know, if it's, this is the change of the function, the function is no longer going down at that point but it's not yet starting to move up at that point. It's not moving down, it's not moving up, it's not you know, moving at all. It's not changing at all at that point. And so we're not surprised geometrically that the, um, that, that the slope is zero. <clears throat> it's no coincidence that the slope is zero at this minimum. It's called a local minimum in the biz because you know, locally around these points, it's not the absolute minimum necessarily. This function could, dip down lower someplace. In fact, it is the, the absolute minimum for this function, but that, that's not important. It's called a local minimum, just as this is called a local maximum. This is certainly not the highest point on the function. This point is higher, this point is higher, but in this area, in its domain, it is the highest point um, in, in its interval. So these are minimums, maximums, minimums. And as we continue to move X along, we see that the slope does begin positive, becomes positive, more and more positive, becomes steeper and steeper and steeper. At some point, it will reach a maximum steepness. This is as steep as it gets. As X continues to proceed along, it begins to start to flatten out. You see the blue lines beginning to flatten out and flatten out and flatten out until finally we reach again that maximum. If I can get there. 
we reach the local maximum of the function and again, we find the tangent line again is zero. Yeah, it's interesting, a maximum and a minimum, they're quite different geometrically. My goodness, they're kind of opposites geometrically in one sense. They have one thing very much in common. They have a zero tangent line. <laughs> okay. And the function will start to head down. And so we'll see that the slopes will become negative. It'll become negative and negative and negative until we reach a maximum negative. It doesn't get any more negative than this. As X proceeds along, it begins to start to turn up and become less and less negative until finally it reaches a, another zero in terms of slope. And then it goes on its merry way, just getting steeper and steeper. Okay, if you've been cheating <laughs> and or if you have the ability to watch the other side simultaneously, I congratulate you. But if you've been cheating, you've noticed something very much going on on the right-hand side, okay? okay, mirroring this whole thing. Clearly, when you're looking at these red dots, these red dots are the same X values. And for the derivative function, which is four X cubed minus eight X plus three. And for you people who have not taken calculus, you'll be surprised that all the people who have taken calculus, they could read that off. Isn't that amazing? They can look at X to the fourth minus four X squared plus three X plus one. And they are all geniuses. They can go ahead and take that, that process that we have of making delta x smaller and smaller and looking for the pattern for any kind of point. And they can look at 4x squared minus, uh, I'm sorry, x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 3x plus 1 and read off visually 4x cubed minus 8x plus 3. Are they geniuses? No. <laughs> they know the algorithm. Okay, They know the algorithm. <clears throat> or they have, re they, they, you know, dredge back in their memory the algorithm that they once knew. Okay. We aren't there yet. We haven't we haven't studied the algorithms yet. Okay. So don't so don't don't worry about that. But clearly these three red dots here, these three maximum minimums, they are the zeros of the derivative, right? They are the places where the slopes are zero. And so on the derivative function, they are, you know, where the where the where the derivative function crosses the x-axis where the y value is zero because the y value of the derivative function represents the value of the function, which is the slope. Okay. And that place where the, where, the, where the graph was at its greatest uh, slope, it's, here is where it is. It is there, there is no greater slope that right here in this, in, this, in this interval. This is the steepest part of the, of the graph. This is where the, where, the, where the function is changing quick, its quickest. It's increasing at its quickest rate. Yeah, the derivative function will have its maximum. Okay. And here where the derivative is negative, it's getting lower and lower. Uh, the derivative is decreasing. This is where the derivative function will have its local minimum. This is not easy. It is not easy to capture this, these ideas. You don't capture this the first time you see it, okay? This is why taking Calc 1 is useful at some point if you can get these ideas. Unfortunately, they rush through these ideas in one class and they start taking derivatives right away. But if you can try to get both sides of the street here, this is, this is not easy to, to make this connection uh, between the function on the left and its derivative function on the right and what that relationship is. We will look at this again. We will look at this again and again to try to become comfortable. You are not gonna become comfortable with this. You're not gonna internalize this the first time you see it. What I'm looking for is for you to get the idea, to see that there is a relationship, to look at the red dots and say, yeah, the red dots on the function, which are the minimums and maximums, tell me where the slope is zero. And sure enough on the derivative function, that's where that function is zero. It's y value is zero. I'm beginning to see some connections. Okay. I wanna finish the presentation guys so that we can get started on the other one. So let me finish the last two slides uh, uh, because they're so important and, then, and then, then I'll take questions. This is the third most important <laughs> slide in the presentation. 
<clears throat> the relationship between this whole business of the rate of change of the derivative and how does it bear on the area problem? Remember the area problem is not really changed conceptually since the days of the Greeks. The, uh, Archimedes was a master uh, uh, of the technique. You're looking for an area of, uh, um, under a curved surfaces. You use uh, you know, figures that you know the area of and you stuff them in in very clever ways and exhaust the area of your curved uh, space by being very, very clever, by being a genius like Archimedes, by picking the right kind of figures and finding how the pattern works and the stuffing works, very, very difficult to do. Every single area would require a different kind of analysis. There are no algorithms here going on. It takes one genius idea after another. And turns out that, you know, what you'll, what you'll get is, is the area in, the, in this exhaustion process. In the platform of analytic geometry, we do it much simpler. We always take the same kind of figure, a rectangle. Okay. Why is that so important? Why does that turn out to be so important? Because what, what are these rectangles doing? As, as the area accumulates, as we're accumulating the area, as we, in our mind's eye, let the point X move across as the area gets bigger and bigger. If I'm always using the rectangles, how is the area changing? How is the area accumulating? It's accumulating by the size of the new rectangles. As I build new rectangles, as I move my X point across, if the, if the function is going up, then my rectangles will be getting higher and higher. I'll be accumulating area faster. If, the, if the function is going down, then my rectangles will be getting shorter and shorter and I would be accumulating area at a slower rate. Can you see in your mind's eye that the rate at which the area is being accumulated does track with the actual value of f of x? On the one hand, this is a very profound idea. On the other hand, it seems to come out of nowhere. Like why are you, we're trying to find the area. Why are you talking about the rate in which the area changes? I want to find just the area. Give me a whole bunch of rectangles and I'll try to add them up. Why is the rate at which they're accumulating so important? Where, where is this going to lead me? Okay. And the other idea is that this, this tracking business, that in fact, the area is accumulating in the same way that the values of F are changing. Well, if you can buy that idea that the rate at which the area is accumulating is being tracked by the actual values of f of x itself, I have a piece of notation for you. This is a piece of notation. There's no way to make sense of this without it's being explained. This is another piece of genius uh, notation by Leibniz. <clears throat> it says that the area function can be thought of as the summation of all the little f of x's. Take all those little rectangles, take the height f of x times the width d of x, okay? <clears throat> and add them all up. That's what that big s is. That's just an elongated s. Add that from zero up to where you want to start. I'm so where you want to start, stop at x. Take all the sum of all those x's. Well, I can't, there are an infinite number of them. Well just then take d of x to be a small number and end up a lot of little rectangles and do it again and again and again, just as Strogas says, keep doing it, don't stop. That's the process of, of calculus. Get the process and don't, don't stop. Don't let infinity stop you. Keep going to infinity. And you wind up with this again, very beautiful, very intuitive notation. Among his many geniuses, he had a genius for, for notation. This is so su suggestive of what's going on. Let's go, what is this business of the sum? Let us go back to that very important sum that I showed you here. I can quickly go through all this. When we first of all did this process of adding these rectangles and getting that algebraic form down the bottom, it's a whole bunch of sums of these rectangles. 
is H1 times delta X, is H2 times delta X. But what are these H's? They're just functional values. They're the values at the midpoints uh, of the interval. They're, the, they're, they're different Y values. When you factor out the delta X, look what you get, you get a sum. You get a sum of a bunch of Y values times a delta X. Okay, the algebra allows us to do this factoring. We can see it as a sum. What happens as delta X gets smaller and smaller? There we go with the delta X getting smaller and smaller. A coincidence? No way, <laughs> no way. This is the other half of calculus. We use the delta X getting smaller and smaller for the derivative. Here we are with the delta X getting smaller and smaller for the area. Coincidence? No way. So you can see where we have this sum term, this sum of, uh, of, of values of the function all times this common delta X, letting delta X get smaller and smaller. That's where Leibniz comes up with this notation. He lets it in his mind's eye, he lets it in his mind's eye go to infinity. And he describes the infinity process by calling it delta X, DX, okay? And they're all the Fs, so it's just F of X, it's all the Ys. And we get this notation. I emphasize this because you're saying, I don't understand, I don't, I don't, un I can't figure out this notation. There's nothing to figure out. You have to see it's defined this way. Okay, it's written down this way. There's nothing you can figure out. It's like dy dx. dy dx means nothing in itself. You have to understand where it comes from in its context. Well, if you can agree with me that the rate at which the area is changing, who knows why that's important. This is the genius of finding this connection between rates and the area problem. If you can see that the rate in which the area is being accumulated is tracking the actual value of X, we know what the rate of any function is. Okay, the area is a function. You give me an X and I'll tell you what the area is out that far. Okay, not easy to do using the method of exhaustion, but conceptually it is a function. It does depend upon how far out you go. It depends on how much area you've accumulated, how much this, what Trogas calls his teacher, his calculus teacher called the magic paintbrush. I think he uses that, I think in the book or in the, in the talk, I forget which is which, but his calculus teacher described this as a magic paintbrush that the Y value is painting the area as it goes out. I'll show you the magic paintbrush in a minute. But if you can agree with me that the rate in which the area is changing, is accumulating, is in fact tracked by the function itself, well, then I know what the rate of change of any function is. It's the derivative. The rate of change of any function is its derivative. So can it possibly be, is it that simple, that the rate at which the area is changing is in fact f of x? That the secret of this whole problem is if you want to know what the area function is, just find out what function has f of x as its derivative. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's the part of the calculus on the other side. That's the integral calculus. It's called the fundamental theorem, not called the fundamental theorem for nothing. It is truly the fundamental theorem. It connects the area problem with the derivative. Let me say it again, if the area is accumulating at this rate, at the rate in which the, the Y value is in fact changing, it is, the area is accumulating just like F of X, then is it possible that the derivative of the area function is in fact F of X? And the answer is yes. We have to prove this, not today, but we have to prove this. This is why Newton and Leibniz, this is one of the few reasons why Newton and Leibniz are considered the inventors of the calculus. Not only did they see this connection, but they made it algorithmic and they showed what a powerful uh, idea it was to solve many, many problems. Other people before them saw this idea, but didn't make a big deal about it. Didn't see that it was the heart of the problem. Certainly didn't turn it into, into an algorithmic powerhouse in which pow complex problems could be solved. That's one reason why Newton and Leibniz both did this independently are considered the inventors of the calculus. They saw the fundamental theorem. Now we have our function, we have our painting function, x squared. 
This is what paints the area okay? as, it, as, as X moves along. Take my word for it that it turns out that the function one third X cubed has as its derivative X squared. Just take my word for that, okay? <clears throat> the derivative of this function I'm calling capital F of X, one third X, X cubed, very nice uh, comp computational rule, has as its derivative <clears throat> X squared. Okay. Therefore, what the fundamental theorem, I'm sorry, it's called something, it's called the primitive or the antiderivative of f of x. It's the function that you'll get f from if you take its derivative. <clears throat> Strogas calls this going the opposite way. If I give you f of x, can you find me the capital F of x? Okay, that's another whole set of algorithms. Okay, <clears throat> we got to work on the ways of taking derivatives. Now it seems because of the fundamental theorem, we have to find a way if I give you a function, can you find me the function it comes from? Can you go backwards and tell me the function whose derivative is the function I'm staring at, the ones who's doing the painting? Turns out I'm giving you the answer for this particular problem. It's one third x cubed. Trust me on that. So this function one third x cubed is called the primitive or the antiderivative of f, f, f of x. Antiderivative is a good name. You know, it's kind of the opposite. You're going the other way. Well, according to the fundamental theorem, the area function, this crazy bunch of notation, it's called the integral from zero to x of f of x dx. That's how you'd read that. Let me read that again. It's the integral, it's called the integral sign. So it's the integral from zero to x of f of x dx. The fundamental theorem is that is capital F of x. That is one third x cubed. We notice up here in the corner, this was the uh, approximation for these uh, uh, rectangles. We were getting closer and closer to a third, okay, with, with, the, with these rectangles here, this width, we were out to at least three decimal places uh, on the one third. That's where this comes from. It comes from uh, <clears throat> a piece uh, of the Mathematica picture, okay. I claim that this is the, this is the, you know, exact solution. The exact solution of the area function is one third x cubed, giving any x you like. So the area out to one is f of one, which is one third of one cubed which is exactly one third, okay? This would, this would amaze Archimedes. <laughs> it was that easy. I mean, I did all that work and this is all you have to do is like evaluate one third of one, this is it? Well, yeah, because of all the ideas we've been working on for three, for three Thursdays in a row. And these are just the conceptual ideas. We haven't gotten to the algorithms yet. But yeah, this is where these ideas have brought us. <laughs> You're struggling in, no wonder you're struggling. I've hit you with so many new ideas here. Okay, so the fundamental theorem of the calculus. We will, again, look at this um, again. But a picture I think will help. And I think this picture does very much help. I think this, this is our picture. Okay, I wanna show you the magic paintbrush here. Okay, there's a lot going on here. This is our function. Our function is written up here. F of X is equal to one minus X squared. It's an upside down uh, parabola. <clears throat> and this is just a function of values. This is just the X, Y value of this point here. It's the red value here. So right now I'm at one. You can see X is one and Y is zero. So that's the, that's the value here. I'm gonna be able to move. This is B here in my, in my program. So I've called B, this is just this X value. I can move back and forth here the way I like. The magic paint, magic paintbrush. I'm just changing the value of X and Y. But most importantly, we have the area function and that's down here. So the area out to one is the 1.33. This is the exact value of the area function. This here is a little bit fancy. This is the area from minus one to zero because I can be very fancy. I can also change the A value. Okay, I can go back that way, take a simple number. I can go from minus 0.3 over to one and I can actually calculate that area. Yeah, Archimedes would be quite amazed um, uh, at, at, at the simplicity uh, of, of what we've accomplished here. But let's keep, uh, let's keep A fixed for now and we just have our simple area function, okay? And so as I move the magic paintbrush back and forth, I simply can compute the area at any particular point because I have a simple computational rule. Haven't even shown it to you. 
The computational rule is all the people uh, right now uh, in the class who remember their calculus, they can look at that function one minus x squared and they can just read off for you the primitive. They can simply read off for you the antiderivative of one minus x squared, it's x minus x cubed over three. They can just read it off, okay? Because they know the algorithm. <clears throat> so that's the algorithm I'm using to do all these computations here. Didn't bother to you show it because it's not important. The fact is we do have, uh, I am using the antiderivative, okay? And there, there it is. There's the function itself here. There's the area function, which is the primitive. And just uh, to complete the story, <laughs> here's the slope function. Uh, and again, I can read off the slope function. If the function here is one minus X squared, the slope function probably won't surprise you is minus two X. Mm -hmm. And you can see when X is negative, when I'm in the negative area, minus two times a negative number is, uh, um, minus two times a negative number is a positive number. Minus times a minus is a plus, and I am getting a positive slope. And when I move over to the positive side and I have positive X's, minus two X will give me negative numbers. It gives me negative slopes. And, and of course, when we're here, and zero, if I can get there, if I can get at the value zero, then minus two times zero is zero. And the slope is indeed at our maximum as we saw again. So here are our three functions for, for X squared. We have the function itself, one minus X squared. We have this gray area, the accumulation function uh, is the primitive, is the antiderivative. And we have the derivative of that function, one minus X squared, which tells me the slope. And there we are. I'm exhausted. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. All right, let's open the mic. And uh, Mike, could you, can you start us off with some questions? Um, we have not had any questions in the chat box at all. Okay, well, I think I've exhausted you all. I think, I've, I think you're, <laughs> you don't know what to ask first. Let's open the mic and see if anybody has, please, we, 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 we need questions right now, clarifications, not general overall philosophical comments. This is not the time for this, but if there's a question I can clarify in some of these ideas, please ask. All right, I'll, I'll take that as an intimidation, <laughs> not to ask what you wanted to ask. All right, guys. So, and the last slide, all right. Differential equations, this business about rates. What, 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 why is the calculus so important? Why is it so ubiquitous in all of science? <clears throat> it's because the fact that what the laws of nature are written in the terms of differential equations. What's a differential equation? It's not a big deal at all. Let's take an example. Let's take something close to home, <laughs> maybe too close to home. Uh, in a pandemic, infections spread at a rate proportional to the amount of the infection already present. Yeah, that's the killer. That's the thing about infections. The more infection that's around, the more it spreads, the faster it spreads. This is an empirical fact that we know about the world. Okay? Can we describe that mathematically? Turns out we can, and it's going to be a differential equation. Okay? So let Z be the amount of infection. What do I mean by the amount of infection? Well, if it's people, it's the amount of people infected. If it's a bacteria in a bacteria dish, it could be the number of cells. It could be the weight of the bacteria as the bacteria grows. It could be the color of the bacteria because as the bacteria gets thicker, it changes color. And I could measure um, the, the amount of bacteria by the frequency of the color. Any kind of measure of the amount of, of infection around will do, okay? Z can be any kind of a measure. Let T be the time. And we assume that the amount of bacteria depends upon the time, that as the time goes on, if we are in a, a place of spread, then as time goes on, Z will get bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? Well, <clears throat> it's since the rate of, of, uh, of infection, the spread moves at a rate proportional to the amount of infection already present, Oh, that proportionality, that's a mathematical term. That's not just a qualitative term. Yes, it can first of all be written qualitatively. All the poets in the world understand that. 
get the infection at a rate, you know, proportional to it's just as amounts to amount that's already present. Okay. We write that mathematically. We can say that the rate of infection, dz dt, yeah, dz dt, that's the rate of change of z with respect to time. That's the rate of infection. That's the rate of increase of infection is proportional to z itself. As z gets bigger and bigger, the rate of infection, the rate at which the infection grows gets bigger and bigger in step. That's what that very innocent first statement says. That's why we've got rate proportional and already present in red, <laughs> okay? That's what we're trans translating into mathematics, right? Applied mathematics, the heart of applied mathematics is first of all, the translation process. Okay, so if the rate of infection <clears throat> is proportional to Z itself, then we can write dz dt is equal to some proportionality constant k times z. That's the way you turn proportion into, a, uh, into an equation. You have a, a, a proportionality constant. That's a differential equation. It's an equation that has a derivative in it, okay? That is a simple differential equation. What does k depend upon? Depends upon environmental conditions how many nutrients, how much oxygen you're giving the bacteria in the Petri dish. Uh, depends upon if people want to do social distancing, if they want to wear masks, if they want to get uh, vaccines or not. Depends upon environmental conditions, how virulent this proportion counts and is, how quickly it'll grow. Depends upon the environment in which this uh, bacteria, growing bacteria finds itself. That's what determines K. So we have a differential equation, okay? Now, in a, in a regular algebraic equation, two X plus five is equal to seven, the solution to that equation is a number, right? Looks like the number is one, two times one plus five is seven. So the solution to an equation is a number. The solution to a differential equation is a function. Yeah, what calculus studies is functions and the properties of functions. We need to find a function whose derivative is proportional to itself. That's what this problem is, is telling us. It's a problem in the real world. We translate it into mathematics and we now have to solve it mathematically. So hopefully we can make predictions as to how this uh, pandemic will grow. And hopefully that will help us find mitigating uh, um, processes which will help kill the pandemic. But the one of the first things we need to know is how it grows. And if we can model that, uh, as we saw all those curves and talking about flattening the curve, as we heard so much about on TV two years ago, this is the curve that they were talking about. Let me not give you and keep you in suspense. The function is a times e to the kt. It's an exponential function. A is the initial size of the population where we began this uh, measuring thing. And there's our k. Oh, yeah, k is there. <clears throat> Kt is there in the function itself. So this is a very nice computational rule, okay? This is taking e to these powers. e is a the second most important constant in mathematics after pi. Let's not worry about the details of this, it's not important. It's a computational rule, okay? And certainly uh, that Kt is there in the rule. So here's what this function looks like. Now, what do we mean that the rate of growth of the function is proportional to the functional value itself. Well, let's take a particular time and let's see how much bacteria is there. This is the amount of infection there is at that time, okay? That's what Z is. Z is measuring the amount of, of bacteria, the amount of infection we have at that time. What we're told is empirically, we learn in the real world that the Z dt, that is F of T, F, I'm sorry, F prime of T, that's the slope at that point. <laughs> that's the whole point that we should be doing, right? That's the whole point that we can make that incredible statement that the rate at which that function is changing is the slope of the curve at that point. But we notice that that slope is positive. That is the rate is positive. That is this function is only getting bigger because of this empirical statement that the rate of, of growth is proportional to Z and Z is a positive number. The rate is positive. In fact, it's proportional to that rate, it could be twice, it could be three times, who knows what K is. So therefore at a later time, we expect a higher amount of infection 
because the rate is growing. Not only is the rate growing, not only is the amount of infection growing, but Godness, the rate is growing because we're told that the rate is always proportional to the amount of infection. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Not only is the infection growing, but the rate at which the infection is being produced is growing. That's what this differential equation is telling us. Yeah, this is really something. <laughs> We've moved into the real world. This is applied mathematics. This is calculus in action. And we're only working conceptually. We haven't even gotten to the algorithms yet. So just to, just to finish this off, Z uh, is the, the computational rule is A times E to the uh, KT. If you were to take the derivative of that, trust me, the derivative of that is K times A e to the k. It's just simply k times z. And yes, it is a solution to the differential equation. dz dt does equal kz. And that's what I had here in red. That's my differential equation. This equation solves that differential equation. This is the way the bacteria grows. I can now put in different times and I can predict for you if nothing else is done, if there are no mitigating uh, processes found, if this thing is left unchecked, this is the way this thing will grow. It will grow to infinity. It'll kill us all, or at least it'll infect us all, unless something can be found to flatten the curve. And that's been our life for the last two years, right? <laughs> our life in a differential equation. Okay, guys, we're finished with this presentation. <clears throat> Any questions before we before we move on? Can we open the mic again and ask some questions? Anything in the chat, Mike? Um, I posted something in in, in the chat, a link. <coughs> excuse me, a link to the uh, Massachusetts Water Resources Board, which is uh, graphing the wastewater samples in Boston. Yes, I heard about that. Uh, and it's a very dramatic uh, uh, curve um, and uh, worth taking a look at. And I think we just had another um, Dwight is Mike, asking Mike, 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 before we go on, if you could if you could email me that link, I will email out to the class. Okay, so want, to, want to take a look at that link and look at those curves. Just email it to me and I'll send it out to everybody. I will do that. Great. Okay, did, um, something, sh did something show up in the chat box while we were, while we were talking? It, yes. Uh, Dwight asks if the math is the same for diminishing infections. Yes, it would also be, a, it also would be a, a, a exponential growth and this K becomes a negative number <laughs> and the curve curves down with K being a negative number. That is, it would be decreasing at, uh, at that rate. It would be kind of eating itself up in that sense. Okay. Peter, this is Jenny. Yes, Peter, yes. What's the E again in that slide? E is, e is uh, the natural logarithm. It's about 2.7 something. It's, a, it's an irrational number, very much like pi. Uh, and it is the basis of the natural logarithm and it is the basis of the natural exponential function. Uh, this is Euler's number. It's a very, very powerful, important number. We'll talk about it later on. Uh, we'll talk about it as we get into the X. I wanna, besides looking at just simple polynomial functions, I just wanna take a peek at the sine function and the peek at this exponential function. <clears throat> and at that time, we'll look at the derivatives of those and the integrals of those and see some applications of those. And there's where I'll get an opportunity to talk about E, if you can just hold on for that. Yep, thanks. Okay, I'll close this down, guys, and we'll start, uh, where am I here? Okay. I wanna, I wanna run through uh, some of this stuff quickly because this is really historical background. There are a few important points we wanna make. All these things are relevant to the history of calculus. This is not, we're not doing a history of Greek uh, uh, math. We're not doing a general history <coughs> in any way. 
Uh, please go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, if, um, if you have unmuted yourself, please mute yourself again while we continue on. <clears throat> um, but I think some of the points that I, I, I think here are, are, worth, are worth looking at. <clears throat> Mathematics as we understand it begins with the Pythagoreans and this mythical character of Pythagoras. Uh, the story goes that he is the one who kind of showed the great connection between mathematics and the real world. This woodcock here back from 15, you know, 1500, uh, uh, and here's uh, Pythagoras on the, on the Cathedral of Chartres in 1200 AD. He's been part of our Western culture uh, forever. And um, the, the, the woodcock here very much depicts this basic idea of the different hammers hitting the anvil, the different size of the hammers will create different notes, the different size of the bells, different weights of the bells will create different notes, the different lengths of the strings or the different tensions on the strings with different weights will create different notes. And finally, the different holes, different lengths of the vibrating tubes by changing the uh, hole lengths will create different notes. These mathematical numbers create different sounds. Okay? That's the basic idea which Pythagoras gives us among, among many. And the kicker is some sounds are pretty and some sounds are ugly. Some sounds have a harmony to them and some sounds have a dissonance to us. Why is it that we have this aesthetic sense of some things are pretty and some things are dissonant and yet they're related to the numbers, okay? How are we wired that we see aesthetics in, 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 in reflected in the relationship of the numbers, okay? And Strogas does this very nice in the talk, talking about fifths and fourths and three fourths and simple fractions. And he, he, he explains this very nicely, which please go ahead and back and take a look at that again. I don't wanna spend any time on this, but this truly is where the idea that mathematics governs in a sense, the world, the, the, the universe. A phrase that comes down to us is that all is number. And in their investigations of just studying mathematics uh, for its own sake, we, we, we see some nice examples of this. They began with figurative numbers, as it's called. <clears throat> These are the triangular numbers because putting them down with dots or pebbles in the sand or whatever, you can make, you can make triangles. And you can see triangle one is one, triangle two is one plus two, triangle three is one plus two plus three, comes up to six. And, triangle four, et cetera, is simply adding more and more pebbles down below, adding an extra layer, the layer, the first layer is one, the second layer is two, the third layer is three. And so these triangle numbers are just the sum of the integers as they get larger and larger. And this is a progression of numbers. And they, you know, they could be, you could study that pattern and see if anything interesting is going on. Figurative numbers, the square numbers are, are quite obvious. <clears throat> okay, they're just different squares getting bigger and bigger on the side. Now, in terms of patterns, if you notice uh, the tr second triangle number is two times three over two. That's true, that three is six over two, two times three over two. The third triangle number is three times four over two. That's true, 12 over two is six. See, the third triangle number is three, four. Son of a gun, if, isn't the fourth triangle number four five over two? And are we shocked, therefore, if we looked at this pattern going out, that the nth triangle number is n times n plus one over two. Here we found a nice way to add up the first n numbers, right? The sum of the first 30 numbers is 30 times 31 over two. <laughs> it's an algorithm if this pattern holds if we could prove that this pattern is so. And this is what the Pythagoreans did, okay? even with their limited algebra. Okay? <clears throat> There's a relationship between, uh, uh, be, be, between these numbers. Take a look at the square number there. Look at that line, it divides up the, the square into the first triangle number and the second triangle number. Yeah, it's T1 plus T2. Draw the line there, you've got the third, the, the triangle number one and two, and the triangle number down the bottom, one, two, three. So that's square, three squared is two, two plus two, T two plus T three, and so on and so on, okay? So we can divide the square into two triangle numbers. So the sum of the, of the pebbles 
uh, equals the square number. So we found, uh, empirically at least, we found a relationship that n squared is equal to t n minus one plus t n. Now you may think this is just kind of silly games, but in fact it's not. If you're an undergraduate math major and you have the uh, um, foresight to take a course called number theory, you don't have to, it's not a required course. But if you take number theory, it's the most fun course in the whole undergraduate curriculum. This is where you start. This is where you start your undergraduate course in number theory is with Pythagorean figurative numbers. These are just warm-ups to get you started with thinking about integers and their relationships. This is modern mathematics. This is mathematics as we understand it. This is 500 BC. This is where mathematics starts as we understand. It. <clears throat> this is one of the great gifts of, of the ancient Greeks. Talk about patterns of numbers. Here's a great story that I love to tell. I told this last term, a uh, great story that uh, Carl Grossman who's in elementary school, one of the great mathematicians of all time, uh, on the same level, generally, uh, uh, most mathematicians will say as Newton and, and Archimedes, these are the three great mathematicians of all time. And the story goes when he's in elementary school, he's 10, he's nine, he's eight, whatever he is. Um, teacher wants to do something else and gives a busy work to his class. So he tells the class, Get out your slates and add up the first 100 numbers and do that Well, I have something else I have to take care of. He figured he would keep, he would keep the class uh, pretty busy adding up the first 100 numbers. And after uh, a, a minute, uh, and when you're finished, bring your slate up and put it on my desk. Well, you know, he doesn't get even started uh, looking at what he's doing when a slate hits his desk and it's John Gauss um, with the answer. <clears throat> and... <laughs> And so how did you do this? He says, well, I saw a horseshoe in the sky. I saw that one could be added to 100 and two could be added to 99 and three could be added to 98 and they all add up to 101. I have 50 of these. I have 50 of these 101s. Well, 50 times 101 is 5,050, yeah. So this is, a, this is a great story. And of course, this is you know, an example of, of, our, of our little, um, formula that we just found. Notice that's n over two, the n is 100 times the n plus one. And can I write that algebraically, just bring in the two underneath, n times n plus one over two, okay? So there's Gauss using that, uh, that, that rule, which he saw at eight, he just saw it in front of him and literally in the sky, he saw this rainbow, this horseshoe, as he described it later on in life. He saw this horseshoe where the one went with the hundred and the two and the. So this is this is what we call genius. One more pattern before we go. Uh, here's a bunch of square numbers. Um, here's one and here's four and here's nine and here's sixteen. Okay, four by four, three by three. But notice that one, which is one squared, that's the first square number. One plus three. One plus three gives us four. That's the second square number. Tack on a five, one plus three plus five gives us nine and one plus three plus five plus seven. And you get the idea that the sum of the first n odd numbers is actually n squared. Another pretty pattern. This is math for its own sake, okay? Will this have any application? Certainly not in, the, not in their time. This is not gonna help any engineer. It's not gonna help any surveyor. It's not gonna help anybody make a map or do a, do a, a survey <clears throat> or something like that or help with navigation. It's not practical in any way. This is, this is pure mathematics. And this is where it comes from. It comes from traditionally the Pythagoreans. <clears throat> Let us look at uh, the other the other video that I asked you to watch. If you haven't, please take a look at, at, at this video on, on the paradoxes that brought us calculus, I think it's what it's called. <clears throat> and the idea is, is space and time infinitely divisible or is it made up of just a very large number of atomic pieces? This is a classic question, okay, which is still being asked today. And it goes back to the ancient Greeks, okay? To what, what how do you think about this idea, okay? Uh, in classical physics, we think of space as being infinitely divisible. You can always take two, always take a line segment and you can always cut it in half, no matter what, no matter how small. 
Whereas when we get to quantum physics, that's no longer true. There becomes distances which you can't physically think about anything smaller. Okay, it's actually given a name, it's called the Planck length. Okay, and there's nothing physically smaller than that length. That all lengths are made up of multiples of Planck lengths. That's the quantum world as we seem to as we seem to understand it today. So there's a okay. So this is a a, a very contemporary question itself. And the way Zeno brought out this problem uh, is uh, by some very clever stories and paradoxes about motion. And probably the most famous is the one of Achilles and the tortoise. Here's a race. Achilles is going twice as fast as the tortoise. Achilles is going at one meter per second, one foot per second, one so whatever, some unit per second. And the tortoise is only going half that speed. It can only go in a second half of that distance. But we give the tortoise you know, one, one meter head start. Okay? And they both start off, the clock, uh, you know, the gun goes off and they both start moving. Achilles is going at one meter per second. The tortoise is going at a half a meter per second. Can Achilles catch the tortoise? Zeno says, I don't know. I don't, maybe I don't see why. Because in the first step, when Achilles reaches where the tortoise was, that takes a certain amount of time. It's going to take, you know, if it's one distance, then it's going to take one second. He's going one meter per second. It's going to take him a second to get to where the tortoise was. Well, in that second, the tortoise is gone half a meter. It's beyond Achilles. Achilles is going to have to catch him again and again and again. So with Achilles having a speed of one and the tortoise having a speeding of a half, and if you break it down into these steps, every time Achilles reaches where the tortoise was, the tortoise is not there anymore. He's moved on. When does Achilles reach the tortoise? Never mind, pass him. When does he even run alongside of him? When does he reach him? It's an interesting question when you think about it from Zeno's point of view, because there seem to be an infinite number of steps that Achilles has to accomplish if he's going to reach us. Well, as it turns out, these steps, though, are getting smaller and smaller. If you were to add up the steps, these are not Achilles steps, by the way. These are the tortoise's steps. We started with the tortoise's first step of a half. And these literally are his steps. And they all fit inside a box one by one. Yeah. All these steps actually just add up to one geometrically. A half plus a fourth plus an eighth. The 16th, these are all the steps that, that the tortoise will go through as Achilles is getting closer and closer behind. These numbers don't add up to an infinity, even though there are an infinite number of them. They, in fact, all are contained, uh, even in your mind's eye of infinity, all inside a box of one. Okay? And you can go through that. Uh, I'll leave it to you to breaking up the box into its different pieces. Here's a half by half box. Half by a half is a fourth. This box is a length of a half, but a width of a fourth, a fourth times a half is an eighth, and on and on. So the question is, if I were to add up all the steps of the tortoise, does it really equal one? Can I really add up an infinite number of numbers and get a finite number? Geometrically, it looks like it. When you look at the right, it looks like they all fit inside a box one by one. All those areas do seem to add up to an area of one. Well, here's a cute proof. If we call S, the steps, if we call S the sum of all those numbers, then isn't 2S, let's just multiply all the numbers by two. So 2S is equal to two times all those numbers. Ah, oh, but look what all those numbers are. Isn't that just one plus S itself? Haven't we reproduced S and a one in front? So 2S seems to be one plus S. Well, subtract S from both sides, yeah. S is one, okay? So here's a, <laughs> here's a way of, of looking at it. Here's, a, here's probably, this is, a, this is a cute way of looking at it, okay? This is completely illegal in terms of a, what we call infinite series, okay? But this was done until, uh, you know, for all through the 18th century, of playing fast and loose like this. And it gives right answers uh, for, for, for the wrong reasons. But here's, here's a more important observation about how Achilles uh, catches up to the Taurus. <clears throat> Let's look at the position functions of the Achilles and the Taurus. Where is Achilles at any time? It's a very simple algorithm. His position is equal to the time. 
he's going at one meter per second. After one second, he is at one. After two seconds, he is at two. After a half a second, he is at a half. He is at the very value of the time. That's his position function. Can't be a, a simpler position function. His position function is T itself. What's the position function of the tortoise? Well, he's given a one head start. So even at zero, he's, he's, at, he's at one. And he's moving at half a meter per second. So his speed is a half. His position function is one plus a half of T. Let's check it out. At zero, he's at one. At one, he's at one plus a half. Yes, he is at one and a half. At one and a half, he is at. So these are the two position functions of Achilles and the tortoise. We can see just in their table of values, they'll agree at two. They will agree at two. <clears throat> a of two is two. And if you look at uh, A of t plus one, uh, I'm sorry, A of two is two. Two plus, I'm sorry, one plus two over two is one plus one right, is two. So the table of values will tell you that Achilles will catch the tortoise after two seconds. And even if you look at the algebra, set the two uh, position functions equal to each other. When is t equal to one plus t over two? When is t equal to, well, subtract the t plus t over two from both sides and you get t over two is left with one and multiply by two and you get t is equal to two. My point is the algebra has no problem with Zeno's paradox. Zeno, what is your problem? Okay, I've showed you all kinds of different ways in which Achilles will capture, ca capture the tortoise after two seconds, okay? He just needs that one second to get up there and then he, he'll finish off the way the tortoise does and they add up to one. There's no problem here. Zeno says, okay, there's no problem with the math that you're showing me, but how do you execute an infinite number of things in a finite time? Ah, you don't realize, Zeno, the times that I need to execute these things are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. That's why. Okay, so that is in a sense an answer to Zeno's paradox. What's the relevance of this to, uh, to the calculus? Yeah, these steps are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, delta X is going to zero. We will see this again. Okay, we will see this again. Here's a more insidious paradox. This is called a dichotomy. Right? This is a more clever paradox, okay? I wanna just mention this and then I wanna show you one animation and then we'll, we'll be done for the day. This turns the tables and says, well, you know, let's let Achilles run to the first step. Let him run to one. Okay, fine. Before he gets to one, he has to get halfway there. Can't fault me on that. He can't get out to one until he gets out to half. He's gotta get halfway there before. Well, yeah, okay, well, before he gets to the one half, before he gets halfway out, he's got to get to a quarter of the way out. He can't get out to halfway before he gets, he's got to get out to, a, to an eighth of the way out before he's going to get out to the quarter of the way out before he's going to get out to. How does Achilles ever get started with this logic? How does he ever get anywhere when he has to get halfway there first? What's my first first? Any first you pick, pick the smallest number you want. Achille, uh, Zeno will say, well, okay, before he gets to there, he has to get halfway there. When this, how does Achilles start? This is a cl more clever paradox. This is more insidious. This is tougher to solve. This requires a different kind of analysis of, of infinity than the, than, than, than the simpler one. Okay, let me end with just, uh, Again, the, the visual may, may help um, both the steps <clears throat> and, the, and the algebra. Okay, so, so why don't we end with, with this uh, animation. I'm showing it to you both stepwise and as the position function. Let's look at the step. Here's Achilles in red. Here's our tortoise in blue. We're giving him a, a one head start. Here are our steps. And as we go, step one, Achilles gets to one, oh, but the tortoise has gone a half to one and a half. And Achilles is going, I'm showing you the different sizes of Achilles steps. He's accumulating, he is getting closer and closer to two, but these steps, you know, okay. Steps keep coming, getting smaller and smaller, 
when does Achilles finally reach the tortoise? Clearly in this animation, it's, they're so close, you know, mathematic has them on top of each other, but they're really not. Achilles is only at 1.992, okay? The tortoise is at 1.993 by then, something like that. And in terms of the, the, of the motion, here's Achilles, we give uh, the tortoise a, a one head start. We have the two speeds um, <clears throat> programmed. And yes, Achilles has no problem algebraically, motion-wise, catching up to uh, the tortoise after two seconds. Okay, so that is it. We'll call it a day. Mike, do we have any questions in the chat? Hello, Mike? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, no new questions in chat, nothing. Great, any questions we have uh, before we go? Okay, I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign, guys. <laughs> You'll have to let me know, really, seriously. If um, Shoot me an email if you're really having a problem with this, if I'm going too fast, if something, something's not right with you, uh, is, is your silence a sign that I'm losing you? Let me know. If, you, if you're having a problem, shoot me an email. We'll discuss it back and forth, the two of us, or I'll bring it up in class. We'll, we'll try to do something. Uh, I don't want to lose you at this stage because... Once we get through this stuff, which is very nice stuff, I have a real treat for you. We're gonna spend a, 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 a presentation on Archimedes. It is wonderful to spend time in the presence of a true genius. It is inspiring. And I have some very beautiful mathematics to show you. So I don't wanna lose you. Okay, any final thoughts before I turn off the, uh, the, the recording? I would like to say that your way back at the beginning, telling us to have faith in your computation and not be intimidated by the computation and just try to get the ideas was very liberating and the graphics are very, very helpful for me. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Well, listen, guys, watch those videos. I've got more for you next Tuesday. I got a, I, I got a whole bunch of wonderful videos which will reinforce these ideas. So please take advantage of that.